they anticipated that overhand right that AJ's planning to flop because everyone's been talking about Ngannou's power, but I haven't heard much about AJ's. I called it. I saw AJ practicing that right hand with Ben Davison in the dressing room. And there was a lot of focus on Ngannou's power, Ngannou's chin and what Ngannou could do. And it was almost like AJ was the one who didn't have the tools. It was all about what Ngannou could do. And Ngannou bought into it as well. I think Tyson Fury's right. He got a little cocky. It was a bit of a rude awakening for him tonight in there. It was. It was a rude awakening for Ngannou. Um, but it, listen, you get a bit cocky like he did. And it, it was what it was. It was what it was. He got knocked out, and that's what a boxer should do to an MMA fighter. So credit to AJ. He did a fantastic job. Anthony Joshua's knockout percentage is not to be laughed at. 28 wins, 25 inside the distance, 3 losses. And the thing with AJ, 31 fights, 12 of them in world title fights. That's a high percentage of world title fights in 31 fights. If you look at Deontay Wilder's record, it's filled with a lot of F-level fighters he knocked out somewhere in the south before he got to title level. And that's no knock on Deontay. The man's a puncher. Ngannou switched to southpaw against Tyson Fury. And you'd have to say it worked because arguably he won the fight. He switched to southpaw against Anthony Joshua and found himself on the canvas. Yeah? Really and truly, someone in their second fight in a pro ring shouldn't be switching stances. Maybe he does that in MMA, but he shouldn't have been doing that against Tyson Fury. Tried it against AJ, he found the best weapon against the Southport is that straight right down the pipe. I mean, us boxing enthusiasts, we learned that early in the game. Straight right, Southport kryptonite. And Francis was on the floor early in the first round. The shock on his face. Like, it hasn't harmed AJ that his last two opponents have brought into this can't take a punch, mentally fragile athlete that they were going to beat. But I tell you what, the next opponent Anthony Joshua faces will be wise to get researched, informative data on what Anthony Joshua could do. If you listen to them talk sport narratives or them Tyson Fury sycophant media narratives, you're all getting knocked out. I think Ngannou was a little shocked at AJ's strength in the clinch, Ngannou did land a couple of jabs, but he has them long arms. He caught Fury with a jab, and Fury's got long, 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 long arms, very long reach. But AJ had a plan for that, didn't he? Obviously, Ben saw that Ngannou isn't technically throwing that jab right. Sticks his chin out a little when he throws it. Keeps it out there maybe a little too long. And there was one knockdown where AJ even took the jab just to land his right hand and put Francis on that canvas. There was nothing random about Anthony Joshua's skills. It's all about repetition, repetition, repetition. Taking that short money just to get back in the ring while Wilder, Andy Ruiz and a host of PBC fighters chose to stay out of the ring because, oh, well, I'm not getting enough for this fight. I'm not getting enough. And Garnu, the worst thing was that Credible performance against Tyson Fury to go in the ring with AJ. Because what it meant was Dewey probably thought, and I like Dewey Cooper, but he probably thought, I don't have to change this guy much. He's a natural beast. But he was getting away with a lot of stuff. He switched southpaw and Tyson Fury didn't make him pay. AJ made him pay. I was listening to D-Style Boxing and he made some very good points. Like they talk about the skin tight gloves they wear in UFC. Yeah, he takes punches from guys wearing skin tight gloves. But yo, like D-Style said, the more padded variation of gloves in boxing means you can throw harder shots without doing damage to your knuckles. People underestimate the durability you need in your chin to box. They underestimate a lot of things about our discipline here. I say ours even though I don't fight, but I'm an avid fan, just like you. Now, when I went to do the frame-by-frame frame analysis, which I'm showing you here, it's even more vivid. Look at this two frame sequence. Francis is on his front foot. He's slightly leaning forward 
in this first frame, just slightly. He's not upright straight. He's got his chin tucked in, his hands are up. But when AJ throws that left hand, which is the diversion, Francis leans back with his right hand down. I mean, Francis got exposed here. That word is overused sometimes, but it's very appropriate here. He got exposed. You've got to keep your shape. Hands up. Don't straighten up. Don't lean back. Don't straighten up. Move around the sides. Left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left. South port, port side. But he bit AJ's feints all night, didn't he? Post fight, Fury was saying, Styles make fights. When he fights AJ, it will be different. You know, it went from 4 1 common opponents, five common opponents. Fury's only stopped one of them. AJ stopped five of their common opponents now. Like, Nganu didn't come close to knocking down AJ. Nganu didn't bite onto Fury's feints. Nganu bullied Fury a little on the inside for him about at times. Couldn't do that with AJ. I don't think Tyson Fury can beat Anthony Joshua right now. And, you know, I know some Tyson Fury fans get mad, but he doesn't beat Anthony Joshua. He takes a beating, probably gets retired. Forget I'm a fan if you can. From the heart, I'm speaking. I see a host of people, Dean White, Joe Joyce, Johnny Nelson, AJ better not trade. Or he's going to get hurt bad, knocked out. And the second knockdown, Joshua gladly stood in the ring center with him, training jabs, knowing that after Nganu throws his punches, he has no real defense. So he threw that jab, and Joshua didn't care it landed, because as soon as he threw it, right hand again, bam, over the top. Second round, Nganu <laughs> went back to orthodox. <laughs> yeah, on the deck again, on the deck again. AJ didn't have to eat the jab, but he was looking for the counter. Okay, throw your jab, throw your jab. Bam! You throw a pea shooter, I'm coming over the top of your infantry with the whole fucking armory. And in all truth, Dewey, I like Dewey Cooper, you should have stepped in and threw that towel in after that knockdown there. This is a novice fighting at elite level in the heavyweight division. Somebody should have stepped in and saved Nganu the indignity of that third knockdown. Yeah, he would have been frustrated. He would have been saying, I want to go out on my shield. He should have had the decision taken out of his hands. I'm not sure if Dewey Cooper and Nganu were prepared for, for an AJ to be so aggressive so early. AJ didn't look apprehensive about the power at all. Adam Smith said, Josh is one of these guys that just wants to learn more and get better. And I thought it was a fantastic display, you know, reminiscent of an old Lennox Lewis knockout or something. It was what did I say? First minute, I'm watching AJ. AJ looks a bit, moving a bit like Lennox Lewis. Mm. That kind of rhythm. It's taking that little, like, half step, isn't it? Yeah, that's what it is, Doc. Like, you know when they're, they're on the balls of their feet and they're looking to strike like a game cat? would do on his prey. He had that type of look. You say that you felt like tonight wasn't your night early this morning. Was it something specific that happened? You just wake up someday and it's not your day. I can't tell why. It wasn't just my day. Again, that's not taking any credit out of uh, Joshua. He did a great job. Came here and win. Some people were suggesting that Francis was making an excuse. No, he wasn't making an excuse. Look. The first pro fight with Tyson Fury, he was an underdog and he just let the process take place and he didn't stress anything. Tyson Fury was doing all the theatrics. There was no mass fan base or media who had expectation of him winning. If he could make a go of it for a few rounds, he would have exceeded expectations. This time around, like Doc pointed out, Oh, the fans, the fans are a favorite in Ghana. What is this shit? <laughs> it's, uh, you got a lot of MMA fans flooding in, apparently, on the New Zone app. There was a lot of polls who said Ngannou was going to not only beat Anthony Joshua. They, I mean, these polls weren't satisfied with saying that Ngannou would outpoint Anthony Joshua. No, it has to be a knockout. He's got to knock out. The two-time unified world champion, former Olympic gold medalist. And yeah, I believe Francis woke up this morning 
and weighed it all up. AJ's not coming here to play. I haven't seen him smile once. On the face of the zone, when they asked what the fight means to the fighters, AJ said, this is the biggest challenge of my life. He was training like he was training for George Foreman. He wasn't going to just let this MMA guy come and spill him all over the floor so the media and the anti-AJ contingency could have their day. Nah. If you want that W, Francis, you know what you're going to have to do to get it. This narrative that you could go in there and blow on his chin or apply a little bit of pressure and the fight's yours. Don't believe the hype. When you're getting $20 million purses like Francis, $50 million like AJ, bankrolled by the Saudis, yeah? This weren't like no UFC event. They say UFC is big. Do you know how much people were broadcasting this event? You had Sky, TNT, The Zone, media from all over the world are pointing cameras in your face. You've never been in anything as big as this. AJ has. No element of surprise this time, Francis. I bet he's never felt like that in any of his UFC fights the morning he woke up. In our people, it's not an excuse. It's called a reality check. Joshua don't play that. He doesn't play that. He started boxing in 2008. By 2011, he was challenging the top dudes in the IBA World Championships and got a silver medal and then gold the next year. In the Olympics. Yeah, he can be beaten. But anyone making analysis on this fight and just dismissing Anthony Joshua is an idiot of epic proportions. And Garner was dissing Otto Wallin. Like these style pointed out, I'm different to him. Where was you in the Harringay box tournament when they when Wallin and AJ were fighting? Where was you? You were boxing. Not at that level. Francis nearly beat Tyson Fury, but so did Otto Wallin. He nearly beat him too. There's Francis because he'd been listening to people, stupid people, not realising Otto Wallin has paid his dues in tough gyms in America, Europe, won world title eliminators, but because AJ makes it look easy, well, we'll overlook that. Were you impressed with uh, Anthony against Otto Wallin? No. No? No, because Wallen, uh, Wallen wasn't doing anything. So so what did Francis Ngani do next in boxing? Well, if he says he's different from Otto Wallen, Wallen said he's making a comeback. I don't see no reason why he couldn't fight Otto Wallen in four or five months' time. That's a good matchup. You know, boxing careers are often reviewed in phases. Fury started putting his boxing together around 2013. 2012 when he hooked up with his uncle Peter turned pro around what was it 2008 took him a little time to bed down that relationship with Peter and work on their boxing the Kingpin Johnson performance was when we started to see a more composed boxer who was well conditioned threw enough punches and kept his shape well after the Otto Wallin fight it was the Kronk style as many call it with Sugar Hill we're going to turn the boxer into a puncher now. Well, Anthony Joshua, he started as a knockout puncher. Turned pro 2013, fought Ruiz 2019. Got stopped by Ruiz, then opted for a more cautious approach. And then, I guess we'll say from 2023, after flatlining Hellenius, the Otto Wallen performance and the Francis Ngannou performance, we're seeing a more complete fighter. A lot of the Fury sycophants don't want to acknowledge that AJ has, in my opinion, a conditioning advantage over Tyson Fury. He's mentally in a very good place and Fury was thought to be the better boxer, but the IQ gap has closed significantly. But we'll never know until they fight. So yeah, I don't want to, that's why I want to keep on working because I want to make them nights as easy as possible. You know, all I can say, bro, the world is your oyster right now. Because I'll be honest with you, Tyson saw that knockout and he just got up and clapped hands and walked out. Tyson Fury clapped. He said Styles make fights after. But, but let's chain the events together. In Garnu, 
Floors Tyson Fury with a left hook. The fight goes to a split decision. A split decision. This is the WBC heavyweight champion. The belt's not on the line. The fight is so taxing, it pushes Tyson Fury out of the December date to fight Usyk. They had to reschedule it for early this year. Tyson got cut and they've had to reschedule it again for April the 20th. Tyson's forced out of the December date. Steps in. Anthony Joshua. Day of Reckoning. He takes on former Tyson Fury opponent, Otto Wallen, who hasn't lost since he cut Fury with a punch and nearly stopped him because the cut was so bad and actually shook Fury a couple of times with head punches. And this guy is a known puncher. Fury's fight with Wallin went the 12 round distance. AJ, five rounds, pulled Wallin out. Broken nose. That was December. March, AJ takes on Ngannou, who took Fury to a split decision and had him on the canvas. Did you see the fight with AJ? Do I have to explain it again? No matter how confident Tyson Fury is, and mentally strong he is, you know, they say Tyson is the mentally strong one, AJ is the mentally weak one. Maybe Fury doesn't give a toss. Maybe that's irrelevant to him, that AJ is destroying the common opponents between them. But okay, it's irrelevant to him. But it's not exactly doing anything to build his confidence, is it? Watching AJ wipe out opponents he's struggling with, and then what theoretically could be worse is that his body is breaking down. And perhaps that can be offset by how much wear and tear is on Usyk's body right now. That's what this fight might come down to. Not who's got the better resume, not who's the harder puncher, not who's bigger, not who's stronger, but who turns up in the ring in the best condition, not just physically, but mentally. If we do the simple maths with the resumes, with the common opponents between Fury and AJ, AJ's 5-1 up, 5 knockouts to Fury's 1, and AJ's lost to Yusek, who Tyson's fighting. If we do them maths, does Yusek go in as the favourite? And some people are going to say triangle theories, triangle theories. Well, this ain't a triangle. This one's got more sides than a hexagon. Tell you what, it makes April the 20th all the more interesting. I'll say that much. The very aggressive Lewis Green landed a big right hand on Jack McGann. Floored his opponent and the referee intervened. Round one, the first round stoppage. The unbeaten McGann didn't know what hit him, in all truth. That was scheduled for 10. Green. Chin tucked into his chest, high guard, walked his man down, hurt him to the body, went over the top with that right hand. That was it. That's his 17th pro win against four losses. His opponent goes to 9 1 and 1. And then Mark Chamberlain took apart Gavin Gwynn. Mark Chamberlain, 14 and 0, very heavy handed. This was a lightweight contest. And apparently, Chamberlain is one of the Sheik's favorite fighters. And out of the blue, few weeks back he got the call to step up and fight Gavin Gwynn in Saudi Arabia for a nice purse and he's changed his life. Fourth round stoppage victory. Now I've seen Mark Chamberlain before but this is the first time I've actually concentrated on this kid. You know what I mean? And like um, he came in there with a big punching reputation but he actually boxed a very smart fight. Gavin Gwynn didn't. You know you're fighting this heavy handed unbeaten kid. Fresh, ambitious. And for a tall, lightweight like Gavin not to be using his reach is just senseless, mind-blowing. You know, at least in the early rounds, use some defense. But somebody in the comment section said he saw Gavin sparring an amateur and was getting lit up by the amateur because basically he just likes getting in there, getting stuck in. And in the first round, his eyes started to balloon up, collected more damage on his face and was just getting outboxed outpunched and beaten up and in the fourth they stopped it injuries were becoming insurmountable they had to stop it eye swollen up that was a 12 rounder for some WBA incontinental incontinence title Mark Chamberlain who is now 15 and 0 Gavin Gwynn who is now 17 3 and 1 after their contest Kevin Lorena went through with the Justice Hooney fight despite losing his mother just a couple of days ago it's understandable that Perhaps his mind wasn't on the job. I think what was more a negative for Kevin, the South African, is the extra poundage he's carrying at heavy. 
He moved around the ring and threw a lot more punches at Cruiser. Let's just say that. And he just didn't throw enough punches, did he? And Hooney, smooth, nice jab, good upper body movement, good combinations. Was in charge of the fight, probably won every round. Until Lorena buzzed him with some big punches in the 10th and buzzed him pretty bad. But Hooney got it together and managed to run the clock down. Kevin Lorena would be kicking himself that he didn't get going earlier. Hooney raises his ledger to 9-0 for inside the distance. He's not a big puncher because he had Kevin busted up around the nose, but he couldn't put him on the floor. Didn't come close to decking him. Lorena drops to 30-3 and with 14 inside the limit. 29-year-old Israel Madrimov from Uzbekistan raised his pro record to 10-0, one technical draw. Seven of them wins via the early route. He defeated Magomed Kurbanov for the vacant WBA 154-pound title. Kurbanov, 29 years of age. His record is now 25-1-0, 13 inside the distance. Now, I think I've underestimated Madrimov a little. I was thinking this one was going the distance for definite. And I was locked in for a distance fight that might not be the fight of the year. But Madrimov, you know, showed some good variety. I was never that impressed with Kurbanov. He got a gift against Liam Smith in Russia. And basically, he didn't do much, did he? He didn't do much. He um, retreated to the ropes. Madrimov found a home for that right hand, which slammed into Kurbanov's head with regularity. And he crumbled in the fifth round. Nice somersault to celebrate his victory afterwards, Madrimov. Eddie Hearn ran into the ring. In the last couple of weeks, Matram had been stacking them up with Ray Ford and now Madram off this week. Liverpudlian, Nick Ball failed to arrest the WBC featherweight title away from Ray Vargas. The fight was scored a split draw. Nick is now 19-0 with one draw, 27 years of age. The 33-year-old Ray Vargas is now 36-1-1 with 22 inside the distance. Height and reach. Advantage for Ray Vargas. He won the first six or seven rounds, no problem at all. Boxing behind that jab, whipping in left hooks to the body, combinations, uppercuts. And Nick was never at the races, in all truth. Nick came into the fight in the second half. He got a questionable knockdown. He was throwing Vargas to the floor, it seemed, nearly every round. But Vargas was falling to the floor way too easy. He obviously didn't want to give up his belt. So he came back down from super feather to feather, but probably not the best idea at this stage of his career. Doesn't seem to have much strength there. But there was one questionable knockdown where Nick tossed Vargas and he seemed like he was going down and Nick hit him before he hit the canvas. Was it really a knockdown? That was in round eight and there was a more legitimate knockdown in round 11. Left hook to the head and Nick was coming on strong without landing many punches, just basically roughing Vargas up. A draw was a fair result in what was a forgettable contest in many ways. And Vargas keeps his belt. Joseph Parker, 32 years of age. 35, 3 and 0, 23 inside the distance. Took on Gilles Zhang, 40 years of age, who is now 26, 2 and 1 with 21 inside the distance. Big Bang Zhang weighed in at 291, 6 foot 6. Joseph Parker... Was Joe around 6'3", 6'4"? He came in around 247. Parker took a split decision. Thought it was a bit harsh on Zhang. I had Zhang winning the first couple of rounds. I didn't keep track of the score all the way through. Then he scored a knockdown in round three. That backhand caught Joe by surprise. Put him down. Good shot. And he was floored again in round eight. Chopping right when they were close up. But Parker... Faster hands, set the tempo, and at 40 years of age and weighing in 291 and never having a great gas tank, Zhang left the opportunity for Parker to steal the decision. And I picked the fight to end like this, possibly controversial, with Zhang running out of gas and Parker taking a lot of the late rounds. And that's how it played out. That's how it played out. Two very good wins for Parker on the truck now, Wilder and Zhang. Some would argue that he's picking on the old guys. <laughs> but you can't say that. He wasn't favoured to win either fight. So, well done, Joe Parker. 
interim WBO champion. There's a pattern forming. Jang weighed in at 291 yesterday. Tyson Fury weighed in very heavy against Ngannou late last year. Ngannou himself weighed in 20 pounds heavier than Anthony Joshua this weekend. And Joshua is two inches taller than him. Zhang, 291. Baby Miller, how much did he weigh against Danny Dubois? In excess of 300 pounds, I believe. Big is not always best at heavy. That's what we're finding out. It's going to be interesting to see what Tyson Fury weighs in April. Thinking about it now, it could have a big bearing on that result. After all the yo-yo dieting he's done coming too light, he'll probably be depleted coming too heavy, be too sloppy, won't have the foot speed to compete, hand speed to compete. Your conditioning has to be on point with Usyk with all them punches he throws. That championship round finish that he's pulled out several times in important fights. This has got to be one of Tyson Fury's best training camps and we'll leave it there for now. Peace.